started. Good morning and good afternoon and good evening, everyone, wherever you are in the world. Thank you so much for joining Polygon Labs Community Forum number three. We had a massive announcement yesterday, and we'd love to hear your feedback, answer your questions, but let's start with some intros. Hudson, do you want to go first? Sure. So my name is Hudson. I am the VP of Community and Governance at Polygon Labs. Uh, I previously worked at the Ethereum Foundation, did some stuff at Zcash and Flashbots, and now I'm at Polygon Labs to um, help with governance and various things. I'm really excited about the conversation today. And lastly, just to front run one of the questions, it's actually pronounced Zicky VM. I know everyone's been saying ZK, uh, you know, ZK EVM, but it's Zicky VM is what I'm declaring. I'm not ready. I'm not ready to start. <laughs> All right. It differently. We're going to have to put that one on ice. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Next person. Let's, I guess, David. Hey, uh, I'm David. I'm the VP of product here at Polygon, uh, focusing on helping build out the Zicky VM. It's a thing. Yes. OK, uh, Matt. Hey everyone, my name is Mateusz or Matt. Um, I am the governance facilitator. I co-lead the governance team with Hudson uh, and I've previously worked for uh, MakerDAO, uh, Flow uh, and some, some other projects. It's, it's good to be here. Thank you. Awesome. And then um, I guess Brendan. Uh, hey everyone. I'm Brendan. Uh, I work on ZK R and D, some ZK VM stuff, um, and yeah, happy to be here. Awesome. And I'm Alicia Katz. I'm VP of Strategic Initiatives at Polygon Labs. So let's get started. We have five people who have requested to speak. I'm going to um, invite them up here, and we'll answer your questions. Amir, we're going to start with you. I've just sent you an invite. Hi, Amir. You're up. Ooh, uh, Amir keeping us in suspense, or their mic isn't working. It's one or the other. Maybe we'll inc we'll add a couple other people. Oh, it looks like Amir's mic is working now. Amir, hello. Oh, I thought so. They might be muted. Yeah, they're muted. All right, we can get some other people up here at the same time. Yeah, I'll, I'll get someone. I'm going to add a couple, and we can have a discussion. There we go. Bear with us for a moment. Hello, everyone. Hi, thank you for joining us. You're yeah, most welcome. Uh, my question is, uh, actually, I want to ask, uh, uh, when we see polygon roadmap, uh, they in roadmap they uh, in roadmap uh, they uh, you guys have talked about uh, token, right? Um, I'd say that. Our... Oh yeah, so sorry. What, what, what you mean the blog post yesterday or just like in general? Day uh, day before yesterday. Uh, I mean when uh, polygon has shared their roadmap, upcoming roadmap. On maybe on tenth or tenth or tenth of July, uh, they, they said that uh, they, they mentioned that at, about tokens. Ah, yes. I they're... want to ask uh, mm -hmm. uh, if, uh, if, if when we talk about token, are you guys uh, will you guys launch zkvm token differently, or will will reduce the supply of current tokens? I mean, uh, if you have answer of this question, you can guys answer it. Sure thing. So yeah, in the initial blog post that was on the 10th, we outlined a few different things we're going to be rolling out as announcements over roughly the next mm -hmm. month, if not a little more or less. And that's going to be over a variety of issues. Uh, as everyone saw the other day, we had a really exciting one about the uh, move into ZK EVM. Uh, one of them did mention tokenomics, but at this time we don't have anything public on that. Um, and mm -hmm. so, yeah, there's not really any information um, out there about that right now, but definitely be on the lookout for that. The dates are in that June 10th blog post. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Thank you for answering. That's it from my side. 
All right, thank you for asking. Yeah, we have another question about the token. The token used for Ziki VM is ETH, right? So we, as Hudson said, um, have a series of announcements coming out as the um, summer goes on. And uh, July 10th is our next one where we're going to talk about tokenomics. Absolutely. And uh, as far as the token stuff goes, does anyone else up here have any... Um, not not necessarily for the July 10th post or anything like that, but for ZK EVM, um, what has there been things said about some of the I guess economics behind ZK EVM, even outside of the token that that were, would be worth discussing? Yeah, I, I I can speak a bit to I think what the question was asking, which is like on ZK EVM, ETH is the gas token. So when you want to transact on ZK EVM, you need to have ETH in your L2 wallet. Um, and, and behind the scenes, Matic is being used to coordinate uh, interactions between sequencers, uh, who is the job of kind of collecting transactions for users, uh, and provers, whose job it is to prove transactions on chain. Um, so both ETH and Matic are used in the way that ZK EVM operates today uh, in its actual processing. Hey, hey, uh, actually, I want to ask uh, one question also. Uh, sure. Uh, uh, yesterday I was trying your ZKVM bridge on wallet dot polygon dot uh, something. I mean, I have typed your website on the internet, and they from there from ZKVM to uh, Ethereum, I have transferred uh, my funds. And after um, when I have transferred my fund, they have charged me less than a dollar. But to complete that transaction, I have paid almost five dollar uh, to complete that transaction in Ethereum. Why? I I mean, uh, first I have paid uh, less than a dollar, but to complete that transaction, I have paid five dollar. I want to ask on that why I have paid again for it. That's a great question. So uh, I'll give a brief answer, but the deeper answer is going to be likely in the either developer topic section or in a community and lifestyle. Or actually. Let me look here. There's a lot of oh, there's a support section. So there's a support section that's going to be able to help you more deeply with that. But what I would say is when you are transferring, uh, or I should say bridging a token from an L1 like Ethereum to an L2 that is Polygon. Polygon is meant to be a scalability layer to Ethereum. So the low fees are going to happen from you know trading from something inside a Polygon to inside a Polygon to actually you know, move tokens or NFTs or whatever you want from an L1 to an L2. The best we uh, technology we have right now is bridging, and that can incur fees on the L1, which would have been more expensive to, in general, transact on. So uh, to get more information maybe on the technicals or how things like that can be prevented in the future or, like, optimized, I would definitely go to the support section. If you scroll down on the left side of the Discord, there's going to be a whole section in there. And thanks so much for the question. I think we have someone else coming up. Alicia, I, do you have anyone? Yeah, I accepted all of the requests to speak. We haven't had people join yet. Long551, I just approved you to come up if you want to join. If not, we have some more token questions in the chat you might want to check out, Hudson. Yeah, so a really good one I'm just seeing here, and it might be a little out of order, so sorry, everybody, but was there a reason why ETH was chosen as the native gas token and not Matic? Why can't it just be Matic that is the token solely used for everything for ZK EVM? Um, I know that, um, Brendan, you had a lot of uh, thinking behind uh, you know, some of this design and have been keeping up with the various thoughts uh, from the researchers around this and, and, and your own team's efforts. Uh, do you have a, uh, anything to say about this question in particular? So, yeah, let me just clarify. The, the question is, um, why isn't Matic the gas token for every Polygon chain? Not every Polygon chain, but for the ZK EVM, there's like ETH is used for some things, Matic is used for others. Why is it Matic, the token solely used for every function of the ZK EVM? I'm guessing that would mean economic and otherwise functions that, you know, ETH are now used for. Yeah, so, so this, I think, is a really interesting question because um, I think it's a really, really simple and straightforward misconception that's really, really common in this space. And that is that... 
uh, in order for a token to accrue value or for it to be valuable, that it must be used as the gas token uh, for a chain. And I think that that is like straightforwardly false. And here's the reasoning. So um, in, I, uh, let's take ZKVM for instance, um, it will eventually transition to a model where um, uh, there will be a decentralized sequencer and uh, nodes will stake Matic in order to participate in operating the chain. And in exchange, they'll receive uh, fee transaction fees and be able to extract MEV and, and, and everything from the operation of this chain. And so the better way to think about it is that uh, sort of the operators of the chain get yield on their stake token because uh, they're able to um, take some of the, like some small percentage of the economic value that exists on the chain that's paid in transaction fees. And so what gives this, the token value is uh, the demand to stake it, to extract that yield. And whether that yield is paid in ETH or in Matic or in stable coins, it doesn't really matter. That doesn't affect the, the level of demand to acquire the token so that you can stake it and then generate yield. Um, and so from my perspective, and you know, others might have a different view, but uh, the, whether or not the, the gas token is ETH or Matic or USDC doesn't actually matter. And in fact, there are arguments that it should be ETH because more people have ETH. And so you're reducing the barrier to transact on the chain um, and increasing the yield uh, on staked Matic. Um, and so I think that this is like, like there, there's a ton of focus on, um, you know, what the gas token is and, and that, uh, you know, only Matic should be the gas token because otherwise there's no method for value accrual. And I, I think that that's straightforwardly false. Great. And th there's actually a second question that kind of follows up on this. So I'll just tag it on so we don't go through the whole thing again. If ETH will be the native token, will the Matic have any utility? And what you just said kind of answered that, which is, yeah, it's still going to have utility. Validators are still going to be using it as their staking mechanism for the um, you know economic security of the chain um, and the, the general security of the chain. And, and yeah, I agree that like it doesn't matter as much what token is going to be used there. Uh, there's kind of like a like a, a sense like automatically when you're looking at this token stuff, it's like oh, if Matic is going to be used you know, it will accrue more value or, you know, all those things with price will happen, up or down, whatever. But but really, I mean, for how the scale of how things are right now with, you know, L2s and blockchain technology in general, that, that's starting to become a thing where there is this, as we mentioned on the first blog, this like unified layer of, li of uh, liquidity and unified layer of um, all of these things helping out each other and so as far as like one chain being tied to another chain either through bridges or other things so yeah i don't think it matters um a ton i agree with you brendan i think we have someone up here for a question we do lp sahil i'm probably pronouncing that wrong but we'd love for you to unmute yourself and ask uh, ask anything you'd like um yeah hi uh, can you hear me we yes. can. Great. Okay, so I just wanted to ha add a comment to the previous discussion, which we were having around uh, the ETH being charged uh, additionally for uh, bridging from uh, zk EVM, uh, to ETH, ETH, right? So, uh, so, so, uh, as the person was speaking, so he was right that uh, you know the transaction charges uh, are from the ETH side, right? So that is what happens when you use the Polygon zk EVM bridge. But uh, if you go to the same page, uh, there are also these third party bridges where um, these uh, bridges will allow you to transfer the tokens into ZKVM through uh, other chains, such as you can transfer from Polygon or BNB into um, ZKVM. And there uh, I found that the transaction charges are very low. And uh, so that would be one efficient way of, uh, you know, um, economical way of transferring your tokens uh, in and out to ZKVM. Awesome. Does anyone have comments on that? 
If not, I, I have something I can say. So yeah, I 100% agree that there are going to be, basically, competition is going to, like, with it come, you know, lower fees when it comes to things like bridging. We've seen that time and time again when it comes to, like, uh, DEX aggregators, where they take, you know, Uniswap and SushiSwap and uh, one inch and all those on Ethereum, and you know they like kind of compete against each other, and so that forces uh, through market mechanisms to have lower rates. The same thing works here, and I'm glad you pointed that out in saying that there's not just going to be one bridge in the future, is 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 what a lot of people are expecting, uh, and that's already you know on other L2s happening. So uh, yeah, I would say that you're absolutely right. All right, do we have other people up here? Otherwise, I see some good questions in the chat. Yeah, there's a really good question from Saul in the chat. Do you see that oh, one? Oh, yes, Hudson? I do. So there's two questions here. Um, one is, since uh, since the Polygon Validium will provide its own uh, DA, so data availability, will it have data sharding to further lower data availability fees uh, and and data DAS in future for light clients to check the data availability layer. So I don't know DAS, I actually don't know that acronym, but I'm, I think if it, once it's said to me, I would know it. And then the second one, which is related, is how's the progress regarding Polygon POS exploring parallel execution using Aptos STM? Uh, will Polygon Validium or ZKVM implement parallel execution in the future. So this is all kind of around what is the current research and ideation around uh, Polygon's Validium adding its own uh, data availability, um, I guess source or layer, I, I need to kind of refresh my terminology on that. And then second, how are we look? Why, how are we looking at parallel execution in the future? Is that something we can do? Um, so anyone here wants to take that? I can talk a bit about the 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 STM real quick. Um, you know, that's definitely something that we we've put out some some research on, and and we are working alongside with the community on demoing it. I would say that that is a separate line of work from the Validium proposal. Validium is definitely much more focused on the kind of consensus side of things, uh, moving from POS and and bringing it over into kind of zk Validium versus the. Uh, Aptos STM is much more focused directly on how we execute things. So what's the execution client look like? Um, so those are kind of happening in parallel, um, but definitely will, I'm sure there will be updates on uh, both topics uh, in the Polygon forum. And it's probably the best place to see updates on our research side of things. I don't know, uh, Brendan, if you want to touch anything on um, the uh, data availability sampling side, I do not believe we're doing that at launch though, however. Yeah, not not yet. I, I think data, availab data availability sampling is an interesting idea, but I think it's often oversold as a solution uh, because people don't have like a precise definition for like what constitutes data availability. And I think that there's this misconception that you need a data availability layer when in reality, like uh, we already have data availability for the, the proof of stake chain. Um, like validators only attest to blocks where they can download transaction data, so blocks where uh, data is available. And so uh, like you get this data availability guarantee that's built in uh, through the consensus mechanism. Um, and so I think like at least in the medium term, I think that that's sufficient for data availability in the Validium context. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I think we'll, we're, we're definitely interested in sort of the research around uh, sampling and DA layers and uh, sort of curious to see how that, how that develops. But I think that, again, there's this misconception that, that you necessarily need this separate data availability layer when if you have a sufficiently decentralized and uh, uh, you know, a highly staked um, uh, consensus or validator set, then you already have uh, like a pretty good data availability guarantee. Great answer. Um, I think we had a few people requesting to speak unless they pulled out of that. I actually don't know how to check on that, so I'm just letting Alicia take the wheel. <laughs> I'm checking on it. Sometimes they pop up and then they disappear. Um, we're happy for anyone to come up um, if they're comfortable, but um, if you'd prefer to use the chat, that's fine too. Lots of great questions in there for the team. I'll let you pick the next one. 
perfect. Okay. All right. So I think for the next one, I'm going to scroll up a little bit because I think we missed a few, and I want to make sure that we get to some of these. Oh, wait, actually, there's some at the bottom. <laughs> so, you know what? Instead of doing that, I'm not seeing... Oh, wait, wait, wait. Here we are. Okay, this is a good one. Got a question, read the Validium proposal. Does this mean that Matic gas fees will have both ETH when posting proofs and Matic when posting data component? Or will all the gas still be paid in Matic and the ETH gas fee component be abstracted away? Um, and I can repeat that again. That's also um, a little bit up. It was posted at 1117 um, for anyone on here who can answer that. And, and yeah, that is a good question about like where will be the division of of this stuff, especially maybe during the transition. What's 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 in mind? Yeah. So, uh, you know, the first thing I want to say is that the, the proposal that was put forward is to start a discussion in the community. And we hope to get feedback from a lot of different stakeholders in order to, uh, you know, to, to help inform the final implementation. Um, you know, the easiest implementation would be to keep Matic as the gas as the gas token as the native token, super backwards compatible. Things like Ratmatic and, and other integrations that many DApps rely on would 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 remain uh, easy. Um, and just like how. Uh, ZK EVM today uses Matic to coordinate sequencers uh, and provers. That 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 would also remain presumably denominated in Matic. Um, that said, the community should should feel free to express its opinion and and comment on that proposal. Uh, you know, we as a community are going to decide what the best way forward is, uh, and so that's what I would encourage. Yeah, I think that's like part of the series of announcements for Polygon 2.0 that I'm so excited about is having the community's input on all of these upgrades um, and moves forward. And so we're really excited for you guys to uh, participate in that conversation and have your voices heard. Yeah. I'll share the link. I'll share the link again. Yes, please do. And we also have a form now. So just to speak for like three sentences on community, I've said this a lot <laughs> on the previous uh, call calls in here, but you know, I would hate working for an employer who says we deal with community and they actually don't intend to so th this is there really is i swear to you <laughs> steps that are being taken including stuff like the forum post stuff like this discord call and even more stuff in the future including more uh intimate in-person things that are going to be better you know marketed and advertised that will get everyone involved in having these discussions like i really think that there's a, a hunger at Polygon Labs to make the uh, feeling of all of this be really community oriented and together because we want people to be, you know, really discussing this a lot on Twitter and knowing where we're coming from. So that that is something that is obviously happening. So when we say the word community upwards of 100 times in this call, we actually mean it. <laughs> Let's see, is anyone uh, have their hand up? If not, I was going to try to pull up the questions that I lost. Uh, let me see, where are the questions that we had? Because I think there were some that might be related to some of the parts people are missing, especially when it comes to, oh, I think I found it. Yes, here they are. Okay, so what we I'm going to go ahead and pick some of the questions here. But again, if you have questions uh, in the audience, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, feel free to raise your hand to come speak on stage and ask the questions. Uh, any of that would be absolutely uh, great. Ooh, I found a great question for everybody. Okay, so <laughs> um, the first question, this is for everybody on stage. What is FUD that keeps you up at night? FUD means fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So basically, what is something that, you know, people keep repeating that's an inaccurate statement or something that just kind of stirs up controversy that keeps you up at night or bothers you a lot? Uh, who wants to go first? That is a very good question. I would say regulation keeps me up at night a lot. Um, not because I'm scared of it, but because I think very deeply and constantly about how we can, as an industry um, and a community, show 
people making these decisions the value of this technology. I think so much of the time it's really easy for them to look at rug pulls and scammers and the SBFs of the world and miss the very, very real use case and um, benefit that this technology is bringing to the world. Um, one of our colleagues um, and a lot of people from the community have been contributing to an open source use case database that I'll link in the chat. Would love for everyone on this call to take a look at it and add your own, whether that is stable coins, sending money to charities, gaming, marketing, whatever it is, there's so much that this can do and um, we really need to, to put our best put foot forward and show that um, there's real value here and it's not just money. Yeah, I was actually going to say the exact same thing. I get worried that like the stuff that I originally got into this, you know, blockchain stuff for is going to be, you know, erased by people who are, yeah, just wanting money, just wanting to uh, pump their bags and that like 10 years from now, DeFi and NFTs will be the only things that like we're known for. Like I, the value prop website kind of gives a good outline. I'm really interested in censorship resistant use cases and getting data and and money and value into places that have very restrictive governments. I, I think there needs to be more dApps like that, although they are, you know, in a regulatory way, sometimes tricky to complete, um, as we've seen with uh, some, some dApps in particular. And uh, Will, who is on our smart contracts team, uh, actually hit, it, hit the nail on the head in the chat by saying, uh, all this causes the goals of decentralization and censorship resistance to fall by the wayside to make more money. And people can get sucked into that easily, where it's like, how do we make this faster, cheaper, easier to use? And, you know, there's trade-offs with censorship uh, resistance and decentralization. And we see a lot of tech doing that today. So I want to make sure that, you know, technologies like Polygon and Ethereum and others don't uh, sacrifice that. Um, so, yeah, that's that's kind of mine. And then secondly... Um, I'm kind of, I'm not worried about this, but like one day I'm going to have an awkward picture taken of me, like more awkward than what I post with like stupid memes. And I'm going to be like, oh, that picture looks terrible of me. But like, that's not FUD. That's just me being an awkward human. So that's less of a, you know, less of a actual fear. Uh, who wants to go next? If anybody, if anybody wants to just take a quick moment and look at Hudson's Twitter, um, he has the world's most awkward photo of him, I think, dressed as a mushroom. That, that's true. I did make a homemade mushroom costume with my spouse and our best friend. Uh, so, yeah, that is that is on there. So, I really, though, I guess no more damage can be done then. Like, I've already right. front-run it, yeah, to use the word again. Yeah. All right, who wants to go next? Let's hear from Matt. What keeps you up at night? Yeah, uh, I don't think that it's FUD, but the first time I, I got... Um... I got sucked into into the the blockchain world it was back in 2014 um, when I discovered Bitcoin, and the first thing that, that came to mind was that wow, this is you know gold for the for the new age, right, for the 21st century. Uh, and then I realized that it's it's much more than that. It's it's not not a store of value, um, as much as it is just a shift in in, in paradigm on on how people make decisions in the new new age so to speak uh, meaning you now had a conglomerate of of miners each participating in a system with a shared goal um without knowing each other on a you know um worldwide scale contributing to something that that you know may very well out outlive them uh, and so that you know this 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 value of kind of changing how we think about human interactions is something that that I'm particularly afraid of losing, uh, and and it is easy to lose uh, sight of, of of any any value that that has driven us to where we are at today. Um, you know, with 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 much more adoption and much more um, many more people coming into the space, corporations and all of that that was also mentioned in chat and here. Um, it's it's pretty easy to to lose sight of the of those of those like fundamental values of the of the technology, which I think are are incredibly powerful and, and have the potential to change how we think about human interactions in general. Um, not to add that you know blockchain tech 
has the ability to democratize access to to almost almost anything uh and and you know <laughs> having then um some entities come in and 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 limit that heavily right that that democratic access uh, rings true to what what has been you know historically the case uh, right which is that in every in every um society only a, a portion of the of the population has 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 access while the while the rest has to you know kind of live without it uh, and whether that's that's access to you know to to investments to to finance to um to to any any sort of um, uh, activity um that limitation has has always been present Awesome. That's great. Um, we'll have, um, let's go David next. I think uh, my foot is, and this is probably better suited for your Ethereum trivia stage, but some, some guy <laughs> named uh, DevOps199 returns. Uh, um, oh no. You know, we've lost, <laughs> yeah. You know, we've, we've, we've lost thousands or billions and billions of dollars in, in, in various hacks and, uh, you know, throughout the ecosystem and, and I'm always concerned about some latent bug being somewhere uh, in something critical. Um, you know, it definitely drives us to have a, a really serious attitude towards security. Um, everything on the ZKVM side has been audited. We go through with, you know, professors, math proofs, et cetera. Um, and, and uh, you know, although I, I fully trust and have full faith in the system, uh, definitely does does keep me up at night thinking uh, where where somewhere across the ecosystem is going to get is going to get uh, is going is going to get hit by a latent bug. Yeah, Hudson and I's strange hobby is we hang out in exploit recovery war rooms on Telegram um, and help. Um, so we've we've seen a lot of stuff um, as everyone has, but we've also really seen it uh, from the inside. It's it definitely keeps me up at night as well. Calling it a hobby is very funny, but kind of <laughs> true in a sad way. We need to get out more. <laughs> like, seriously, it's how I spend my weekends. <laughs> All right, I think we got Brendan. Um, yeah, I think uh, the FUD for me is maybe... Um, that all that we're doing is building a, a sort of global casino where people can speculate on shit coins and it never uh, expands beyond that or sort of like taps into real economic value. And so, and I don't think that that really necessarily keeps me up at night because I think that there are like clear ways in which we're expanding beyond that. But I think that, um, you know, you, we don't want like, like we're, we're, we're trying to build something that like, has a real impact on the world. We're not trying to play in like a speculative sandbox um, where, you know, people are, are sort of like trading fake internet money. Um, and so I think that that to me is, uh, is something that's important. Absolutely. All right, so we have someone coming up next on stage. Hi, uh, Indy. You're not muted, but we can't hear you. You want to say something? Oh, they might be fixing their setup. All right. While that's happening, and Indy, just feel free like to message and chat once your stuff is fixed. Uh, we'll go ahead and go to another question. Unless, Alicia, do we miss any in chat that you've seen? No, I was just chatting away, but let's scroll up and find some more. Great. Oh, this is a good one. I found one. What do you think of self-sovereign identities' importance in Web3? Uh, who wants to take this one? I can try to. <laughs> Great. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, um, and, and, and for, for context, I've been involved with, with some of the things that, that Polygon ID has been uh, has been doing on our side. I'm I'm by no means the expert, but when it comes to 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 kind of the 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 f fundamental principles, I think that that it, it is again about access. Um, and you know the fact that that many people are are devoid of that access. 
and even even us you know sitting in this in this discord have have been blessed with some with some level of technology uh to do so uh, and you know it's 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 horrifying to think that that there are people in this world who you know who have no no identity because they have no id um no document uh, referencing who they are uh, and nothing nothing like that um and even you know going on the other end of spectrum us having an identity but sharing it with with all of the all of the different companies uh who then resell our our identity or our, our data is is also a non ideal outcome right uh in an ideal world um you would be able to 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 utilize this this technology um to to not only issue your your kind of you know identification but also uh, control where how and 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 you know in what way it is it is being used uh and so i think that that self sovereign identity is is a very promising concept i think that we haven't we haven't even even had hit stage 1 with with that with that concept i think we're we're very very early with with you know our thinking on the subject generally as as an industry um but as we go forward i i, I really hope that that it will be uh, it will be something that flourishes and something that that you know um makes the world better awesome that's a great answer yeah self sovereign identity is an incredibly hard problem um, so I, I personally think how it's going to go is there's going to be just incremental steps towards better identity solutions that borrow elements of decentralization and blockchain technology, and then eventually, w w when it's widespread enough, then, you know, there might be a way to make it kind of more of a universal standard, sort of like how, you know, 15, 20 years ago, we wouldn't think that all, pretty much every person that you see anywhere you go has a cell phone. Like, that's a universal piece of technology that if we were to, you know, perform some standard or app or thing, like, we could get a majority of people to be on the same, uh, you know, you know, system for identity, but then, like, it's, it, it comes down to a coordination problem at that point. So, first step, fix the technology incrementally. Second step, coordination. Coordination might be impossible. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, the coordination part is so difficult. Like, just at the very basics is, you know, making sure everyone has access to a cell phone and internet. Yeah, yeah. Because, like... And that, is, that is massive, massive coordination infrastructure and money for governance. Yeah, because, yeah, I guess, the, and I mean, there are places around the world where, you know, there is no internet, there are, you know, lack of, lack of you know, ability to get cell phones or internet and stuff like that, or, so yeah, it's just going to take some time. Um, I believe, uh, let's see, Indy, are you able to speak? If not, we can get the next person who raised their hand on stage. All right. Uh, let's do this. That is there a next person on stage, Alicia? If not, we I don't, we don't have another request, but we do have a uh, question about what hardware should the current POS validators change? Is that something that this team could weigh in on? Maybe Jackson from the validator engagement team can come come up on stage. <gasps> See him in the ooh, audience. Ooh, ooh, Jackson, Jackson, please come up here. Jackson's really cool. Jackson, raise your hand, and I will, will approve you immediately. You, you don't even have to do an application oh, process. Go. Just right up here. Yeah. Hi, Jackson. Hi. Hi, guys. Nice to join. Um, I didn't quite catch the question, but happy to, happy to jump in and nice to be here. Yes, so the question is, what hardware should the current POS validators change? And, and I guess they're referring to with the recent announcements and, you know, the things that are happening to the POS, you know, chain. What hardware needs to be changed, if any? Oh, good question. Um, I think it's probably too early to uh, provide any solid uh, answer to that question because I think even if we were to ask, you know, literally uh, the people who are developing what will become uh, the ZK Validium if it passes community consensus, um, they're still in, in, the, in the works with that. So I, I, I don't have an answer for it right now is the simple question. Um, I think it would, it would come down to um, what you know, when when that upgrade comes, and when we're aware of um, the changes that are required on that on that client level, on the software level, then I think we would definitely be able in a better position to provide any any um, hardware requirement upgrades to 
you know, uh, full node providers, etc. Um, but at this point, it would be too early to say. Um, so unfortunately, I can't answer that right now. But definitely, we'll keep it in mind. And as soon as that information kind of becomes um, becomes clear as the as the software upgrade comes closer, uh, we will of course communicate that with the community at large and, and ensure that everyone's up to spec, so to say. Excellent. I love that answer. Um, and, and I do want to, uh, if, if Brendan is uh, able to give some clarity to part of this, obviously we are way early to know the answer for sure, like Jackson is saying. But uh, Brendan, if you, if you know anything that within the current understanding of how we may approach this could change things like how much stuff is stored on a disk, if like any kind of running a validator or running a node is going to be better or worse in the future because of this, uh, is there anything that you can elaborate on? And it's fine if there's not. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a good question. So I do think that the validator experience will improve because with zero knowledge proofs, we can do super fast syncing. So you can just download a, a proof and the latest state and verify the proof. Uh, you don't need to sync uh, or download and re-execute every transaction from Genesis. Um, but that said, I, I think that uh, it's important to recognize sort of the limitations of zero knowledge proofs. Like they give us security and really seamless interoperability, but they don't, like it, it's not sort of a magic scaling solution. Um, I think sort of the magic with scaling with zero knowledge proofs comes with when you can uh, use zero knowledge proofs to uh, add new chains and make the bridging experience between them uh, feel like you're using a single chain. So you can have basically elastically scalable block space, um, but it still feels uh, like using a single blockchain when you have unified liquidity and there's sort of cross-chain composability that uh, happens really naturally. Um, and that's sort of the vision of Polygon 2.0, right? Is that we can use zero knowledge proofs to uh, add chains and add capacity to meet demand while still uh, unifying liquidity. Awesome. Awesome answer. All right. What do we have next? Um, any questions? If not, I have... Oh, actually, no, there is a question here. Um, so, oh, I can't see the name of this person. Oh, L. That's just all it is. L. <laughs> uh, I often feel that one way to approach uh, this, uh, and I'm guessing this is the self-sovereign identity follow-up, I often feel that one way to approach this would be for electronic devices to roll out with built-in non-custodial wallets. That could, one, represent a person, and two, a common person doesn't have to go through the pain of setting up a wallet and all that complicated stuff. Uh, any thoughts? So I'll start on this. Um, it actually, interestingly enough, I believe it was the Samsung Galaxy S9 uh, had a built-in Ethereum wallet like that interacted with its secure Enclave chip or whatever. I think the secure chip is what generally it's called in phones, but it interacts with its private storage mechanism to generate an Ethereum address for you and use it. Um, the only problem was it was way too early, kind of like you know a lot of different things in our ecosystem. So no one really used it, and I think they took it out one or two editions of the phone later. Um, so all that being said, what you're talking about would be um, a good idea. I think the thing I'm most bullish about when it comes to having wallets have an easier time being set up by a common person is the social recovery features where like, you know, <clears throat> you and so basically what would have to happen is you have a multi-sig contract wallet so i mean account abstraction helps with a lot of this stuff but it's not entirely required it's been around for a bit with wallets like argent you have a multi-sig wallet that allows you as the main signer to do anything you want to the wallet but as soon as you either don't sign a transaction for like 100 days or maybe you tap your friend's shoulder and say hey i lost my key your friend can send a message to the contract that says, hey, they lost their key, they need this key replaced, but all their assets remain the same. Uh, and then, you know, there'd be a third party that could be like a Google, Amazon, Apple, whatever, um, that also can be a part of the recovery. So as long as a friend of yours and the big company both agree that you lost your key, and it can be as many, you know, entities as you want doing this, uh, then you get your key back. So, like, this is something that I also know Vitalik Buterin has both written a few blogs on and is really bullish on. Um, I do think that that is part of the future of this. Who else has comments? 
posted Vitalik's blog post at the exact moment that you said. <laughs> um, I, I put that in the chat. It's a really great read. Um, I highly suggest uh, you all check it out. Really interesting thinking of it um, around that topic. Um, we have a couple really good ZK questions um, in the chat. One is, is the ZK-based uh, mechanism for cross-chain somewhat in relation to pre-compiles? And then we have another um, ZK question from Saul. Will there be any atomic compostability slash execution among cross ZKEVM, Validium, Maiden chains? Yes, those are great questions. So on this one, um, we can have, uh, who wants to do this one? I guess, uh, Brendan, would you be uh, able to do this one? The first one being, is this ZK-based mechanism for cross-chain uh, somewhat in relation to pre-compiles? So I guess I'm reading that question as, are pre-compiles um, being used maybe to do this? Um, and uh, Esk Valier can maybe like, uh, confirm what the question exactly means, but uh, do you have any initial thoughts on that? And also, what is a precompile when people, uh, if, if like pe for people who don't know? Sure. So a precompile is um, basically an operation that would be uh, really expensive to code in Solidity or EVM assembly. So a good example of this is like a cryptographic pairing. Uh, it would be really expensive because Solidity is not really optimized for operations like this. And so a precompile is um, basically a, uh, a reusable, highly optimized uh, bit of code that can be used to do a discrete operation. Um, and it's included in the EVM and made available to everyone so that they can uh, do things that are, are a little bit more complicated um, at a uh, low cost. Um, to the question of whether precompiles are required for this interchain uh, sort of composability layer, uh, nope. The, so chains won't be verifying proofs from other chains themselves. Um, and we'll release more details about this next week, but um, sort of the like chain, the proof aggregation layer would be handled uh, sort of out of band and then proofs would be posted to Ethereum. Okay, and they clarified in the chat, precompiles are being used in EVMOS, which is a Cosmos-based EVM bridge, if I'm not, not mistaken, to work with cross-chain liquid staking. Just wish to know if that's something being used here as well. Uh, oh, uh, was Brendan going to answer that? If not, I can take a stab. Um, so I, I'm actually not as familiar with uh, cross-chain liquid staking. Um... But we, uh, again, next week, we're, we're going to be um, talking a little bit about uh, restaking and how um, like Staked-Matic can be used to secure other chains that require, or not secure other chains, but uh, can be used to operate other chains that require decentralized sequencers. Awesome. I love that answer because, yeah, I think that a lot of these questions are going to be coming like to like becoming more uh, real when it's like written down in like a longer format and it really already is to an extent on the forum but the uh, further uh, ex like the further talking about this stuff and in, in, uh, man I'm just fumbling over my words the more we write this out the better it's gonna be uh, <clears throat> let's see do we have okay someone is a speaker now is there anybody who has questions and if not, I have some on the on the sheet I have. The speaker that just came up is actually just our mod rejoining. Oh, uh, well, they can ask a question, too, if they got one. And also, mod, could you do you if you're on mic, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, we missed you earlier. <laughs> and if not, you can do it in the chat. Oh, I can't hear them. Maybe their mic isn't working. Yeah, I think their mic isn't working. Gotcha. All right, well, no problem. Um, I'll go ahead and pull up this next question. Um, While you pull that up, mm -hmm. I just saw um, online that the U.S. House Committee is going to vote on crypto and stablecoin legislation in July. Um, so I know that sometimes regulation and policy feels like 
it's out of our hands and it's up to governments, but there's actually a ton that the community um, can do and, and have your voices heard. So please do check out the value prop. I'll put it in the chat one more time. Um, talk loudly about the value of this technology and um, your favorite use cases. Share on Twitter, share in the database, and um, really show these people who are writing policy, voting on policy and and creating legislation and uh, regulation um, that there's real value here awesome that's that that's great definitely check out that link um, so apparently there was a question that was missed um, will there be any atomic composability slash execution among cross ZK EVM uh, validiums and might and chain transactions so like when we kind of set out this multi-chain polygon future will there be composability and execution across all those different chains um anybody can answer that there you go brendan uh yes so uh so we we uh believe that, that the mechanism that we're going to describe uh can support the same level of uh sort of atomic execution that something like a shared sequencer uh, can support but actually it can also go further um and uh enable modes of interaction that uh, you can't even do with shared sequencing. And so, yeah, we're very excited and we'll be sharing more next week. Awesome. All right, so I'm going to pull up a question here for everybody on stage to, to talk about. Um, what's the vibe this year? Is there anything new or different about Polygon Labs uh, that uh, how they approach their internal contributors as well as their community? So, like, uh, we'll start with... Um, Alicia? <laughs> sure. So I'm new to Polygon Labs, but I've been in the Ethereum ecosystem for a number of years and have seen Polygon uh, grow and succeed and really lead tons of amazing mass adoption with some of the biggest companies uh, in the world, Starbucks, Reddit, Meta, etc. Um, also saw that Polygon Labs made the um, top times top 100 uh, companies that announcement was shared on Twitter and discord uh, today so kind of looking back and looking forward the vibe is absolutely mass adoption but what we're really focusing on um, this year and going forward is community governance participation um, and really working to bring all of you and the larger ecosystem along with us and and be core contributors from participating in these calls to commenting in a forum um, and really having a meaningful place uh, in in polygons future so for me the vibe is is really community and the ecosystem as a whole awesome uh jackson do you have anything Yeah, I would uh, love to echo that point, and probably on a maybe more zoomed-in level, um, you know, on on a validator level, I think I'd like to discuss that, you know, the the governance team and the validator engagement team is is forever involved in, you know, kind of bolstering and supporting community involvement in the protocol as much as we can. Um, you know, the introduction of the protocol the Polygon protocol governance calls, um, kind of a mirror and a homage to the all core dev calls at Ethereum. Uh, recently have kind of been a, a great step forward in, you know, uh, opening up the internal processes of the network m more so to the community and, and getting that input and discussion uh, uh, points uh, across the community on the future of the network. And I think that that's something that we're going to keep building on this year. You know, it's something that Matthias and I and, and George and, and the other governance members are, and Hudson, of course, are uh, highly focused on is, uh, you know, that level of engagement and involvement, um, something that I'm Looking at the moment is, you know, a deeper level of community involvement in testing uh, protocol updates and changes before they reach mainnet, and and just in general, like, you know, um, actually create, uh, actually manifesting the reality is that this is a community-run protocol, but obviously seeing that come into fruition on a greater level and a greater scale is something that um, myself and you know the members that we work with are, are definitely looking to encourage and foster uh, the, in the coming six months to a year. So looking forward to bringing that. Uh, through to the community as well. All right, Matt. 
Yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll echo what, what has been said already. Uh, from from my point of view, uh, I'm really happy about the uh, some of the frameworks that, that have been put in place. Uh, earlier this year, uh, the Polygon Improvement Proposal Framework was was uh, was initiated. If you are familiar with the EIP process, then you're already familiar with the PIP process. Uh, it, we basically emulate uh, Ethereum and how we uh, how we perform upgrades, how we gather consensus. And the PIP framework is supposed to to you know provide a social coordination layer uh, for the decision making that ultimately happens on chain and in the wider ecosystem. Uh, and so I'm 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 really happy that that it's it's live and operational. As well as that, um, even now we have two posts on the forum. Um, well, even more, but <laughs> specifically on governance, we have two um, two posts that that are uh, focused on what we call the uh, the polygon governance pillars. Um, so there is protocol governance and there is system smart contract governance um, that I would like to invite everyone to participate in. Uh, I'm gonna send the link over as well. Uh, you can check it out, see um, kind of what our thinking around these these subject is. You know, see where you can fit into the uh, the governance model, uh, where where your participation would be meaningful. Whether you're technical and you know would like to get involved on the core uh, core layer of the protocol, or non-technical and would like to discuss things like public goods funding that we'll get to uh, in, in in a couple of weeks as well. Um, there is a room for you in Polygon. There's a room for you in Polygon governance, and I think this can be can be overstated. Uh, everyone is welcome to participate. So um, the first step would be probably checking out the forum where all of those discussions happen async. Um, and yeah, it's 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 really a, a good year so far, I must say. Awesome, awesome. Glad to hear it. All right, for me, I was just gonna say that uh, yeah, this year is gonna be. I feel like very different than previous years at Polygon. I've been advising Polygon since the beginning, but I only became, uh, you know, an employee at Polygon Labs uh, the last, like, three to four months ago. Uh, but I already uh, can see that there is, like, a change, exactly what Alicia said, towards more community participation and just, like, kind of a more relaxed vibe. I feel like... I feel like there needs to be like you know more faces in front of the polygon name and not just you know announcements or other things so um i, I think that we're working towards that there's going to be a balance in everything so yeah i'm really excited about that brendan sorry just uh finding the unmute button um yeah i i think that we are seeing uh, a real change uh in polygon and I think that a lot of people are going to be really surprised by the extent to which we're going to embrace um, being sort of community-led, community-driven, and uh, the technology that we are going to be putting out this year. Um, I think a lot of people have this perception of Polygon in 2021 when we were sort of this, like, I mean, I, I wasn't part of Polygon, but I, I think there was sort of this, like, lovable... Uh, maybe at times over enthusiastic group that was um, using existing technology that wasn't necessarily groundbreaking to fill a, a need for the Ethereum community at that time. And I think that the polygon of 2023 is one that is leading the industry in ZK tech and in sort of pushing the space forward in a technological sense. Um, and also is, I think, very invested in building community, in uh, attracting organic developer activity, and then being uh, really aligned with the Ethereum ethos and, and values. Um, and so I'm personally just really excited to to see the, the Polygon 2.0 vision play out. I think that it's going to really surprise a lot of people that, uh, you know, Polygon is going to increasingly move into this position where we're sort of offering technical leadership to the entire space. So. Just really excited to to get to work with with Hudson, with Matt, and with Alicia, um, and kind of transition to being more uh, sort of community again community driven and and crypto native. So I'm very much looking forward to. It. Th thanks, Brendan, and I know you're not looking forward to working with Jackson as you did to intentionally omit him. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Jackson. Above all, Jackson. Above all. The the screen with the uh, with the names is sort of 
<laughs> my, my bad, Jackson. For you. No, no, no stress, man. I knew you meant me as well. It's all good. I, I'm, I'm there in spirit. <laughs> oh, Thank man. you so much for everybody joining today and for your amazing questions. I'm so impressed by the deep knowledge of this group and and really great questions that you asked. Um, if any of them got missed, please do send me or Hudson or anyone on the Polygon Labs team a DM on Discord or on Twitter, um, or you can at us on Twitter, tag us in Discord, and we will hunt down the right people to answer your questions. I saw some around gaming, NFTs, so um, please DM us and we'll get those answered. We will be planning more of these community forums, um, and we're just always happy to have you here and uh, so thankful to have you part of this ecosystem. Yep, thank you everybody. Have a great rest of your day, night, wherever you are. Bye. Nice chat. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. everyone.